So picking up after the story of Christ's resurrection, continuing on with the experience that the disciples were having, we hear in the 19th verse of chapter 20 of John these words. On the evening of that day, the very day that he rose from the dead, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you will withhold forgiveness from every any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. And put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hmm. There is a lot in here. Our minds can't help but begin to ponder what we just heard. We think about what it must have been like to see Jesus with the wounds. Can't help but wonder about that. Maybe, maybe we were wondering about how is it that he suddenly appears even though the doors are locked. Or maybe we're wondering what it would be like to be those disciples who felt like their Lord was gone forever and there they are locked away for fear of their own survival. After all our wonderings, after we spend time just thinking through the passage, we're ultimately going to come to a question. There's going to be a question that we ultimately have to face in the end, and that question is simply this. Why was this recorded? Why was this written down? Why was this saved throughout the generations? 
Why? What's the purpose? What is there in this remembering that is passed on to us? Why? What's the purpose? I want to suggest to you that the purpose is found in one single line. That there's a lot in here, a lot to work with, but there's one single purpose. When Jesus said, As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Sent and sending. Sent and sending. We understand what that is. We understand what it is to be sent. When dinner is about ready and we send one of the children to go let the other children know that it's time for dinner, we're sending that one. We're sending that one, and there's certain expectations of what's involved in that sending. That child that we send, we expect that child's not going to go and join the other siblings and start playing with them or engaging in whatever they're doing. No, we've given a message for that child to carry to the siblings. And that child knows that they're carrying not a message of their own, but they're carrying our message. They're, they're carrying the message that it's time for dinner. And the children that receive that message, they know that the message is not with the messenger, but that the message belongs to us. And so that if they give the other, their sibling grief or difficulty or trouble, they know that they don't have to answer to that child. They have to answer to us. Jesus is sending us out. Because more than dinner being ready, God has prepared his forgiveness and his grace. And he's sending us out and saying, Come, for all things are now ready. Throughout the ages, the scriptures are full of God sending messengers to God's people. Sending messages out to the people that they might hear that God has a message of love and a message of reconciliation. Many times that message is housed in the prophets. Those who have been set aside, they are the messengers of God. They're sent out to tell God's people what God has to say. And oftentimes it's not a pleasant message they carry. <laughs> and even more often, it seems, people don't listen. People don't want to hear the message sent and sending. God is sending a message out to God's people, out to the people who will hear the message. And Jesus has carried that message and says, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. That's a big message. That seems rather overwhelming. It seems like a lot to carry. You know what? If people don't want to listen, let's, let's break down a little bit what Jesus is saying. Let's dig a little deeper into it and let's consider what really is conveyed in that as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. There's the as the, even so. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. As 
even so. There's a parallel that Jesus is lifting up. That as the Father has sent his Son into the world, what is that? What does that mean? Well, it means that God has loved us, loved the people of the world so dearly, has loved the people of this world so much, even as we've run from God, even as we've run to other things to fill ourselves, even as we've turned away from God, God has never turned away from us. That God loves us so much that God finally decided to send His only Son, His Son, to express that love. That the message is a conveyance of love, a love that is so deep and so rich and so full that it's in spite of everything that we are. Jesus is saying, as the Father sent me in that level of love, I now am sending you. I'm sending you to love other people with that depth. Even as they're running away from us, even as they're rejecting us, even as they're treating us poorly, even as they are showing in every way they want nothing to do with us. Jesus says, I am sending you to love them. To love them. Now, that sounds great, but <laughs> it sounds really nice on paper, but that sounds difficult. Really hard. That sounds impossible. That sounds like something that a preacher will say that doesn't live in the real world. So let's look at a little more of what Jesus says around that. Let's look at the wrapping first. Let's look at the way Jesus wraps this statement of, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. The wrapping, the packaging. The packaging is this. Jesus says to them, not once, but twice, even three times, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Please understand, this is more than a greeting, a nice greeting of a different time. This is more than, hi, how are you? This is more than a high five or secret signal among the disciples. This is far more than a greeting. This is an understanding of what Jesus wants to bring to us. Just as the disciples were called to be sent, as the Father had sent Jesus, we too are called to be sent, and we too are receiving the peace that Christ is sending. And that peace is more than our concept of peace, of just kind of keeping everything still and at ease and there's no problems. It's far more than that. Shalom is far more than everything is just tranquil. No, Shalom is an idea of everything being proper and in order and as it should be. There is hardly a breath that we take that we don't have that internal desire, that desire to discover and find everything as it should be. We have those rare moments, those rare days or even hours where we share with someone else how everything went well. It was just a, a perfect day. The temperature was right. Everything fell just into place. And why do we tell each other about such days? Because they never really happen, it seems. But Jesus is coming and saying, peace be with you. Shalom be with you. He is saying, I want you to have envisioned the world as it will be. The world as it will be, encased and involved and just swimming in the love of God. 
As the writer of Revelation later puts it, a new heaven and a new earth where there'll be no more mourning and crying, no more pain. And God himself will wipe away our every tear. The shalom that Jesus is giving us and calling us to is to envision a world in which things are put right. He knows what he's calling us to. He knows the journey he took to the cross. And so he's saying to do this, you need to have a vision of what will be. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And then he does another thing that's just very odd, very strange, kind of catches us and we kind of wonder, what's that about? And then we move on because it's just so out of our understanding that we just kind of pass over it. You know, like when you read a, a name of a foreign city you can't hardly pronounce or something else, you just kind of move over and skip beyond it. You heard it, but chances are you are like me. We just kind of move past it because we don't really understand what's that all about. Jesus breathes on them. <sighs> and the best our minds can do and say, well, I hope he wasn't eating Limburger before that. What's that about? He breathes the Holy Spirit upon them. What's that all about? Remember, we're worrying about what it is to be sent out as God sent Jesus out, now sending us out. We're worried about what that looks like to go out these doors and, and play out the practicality of what that looks like. And now Jesus breathes on us. Well, go back with me. Go back to, with me to the very beginning of Scripture. When God's busy doing the creation and, 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 and calls out the light and separates the waters and such that, that now there, there's a, an expanse, a heaven, and, and then separates the waters further from the right, from the left, and, and land appears and, and then brings forth vegetation and then birds of the air and fish and, and then creatures and then humans. And into that first man, looking in every way like a man, but missing one thing. Missing life. And how does God infuse that life? He breathes life into that man. He breathes his spirit into man. The word is ruach, which is the same word we have for breath and wind as well as spirit. Jesus breathed on them. He breathes life into them. Fast forward with me to the prophet Ezekiel, this prophet who is away in exile. He and everyone else from Jerusalem has witnessed the vile overtaking of Babylon, that Babylon has overthrown and destroyed the temple. Everything has been thrown down, and now the people are in exile in Babylon, and everything they knew is now gone. The city of Jerusalem, which God had protected so many times before, the temple which God had, had kept sanctified, had now been all destroyed. And God speaks to the prophet Ezekiel. He speaks a vision in which it's not hard to understand. He gives Ezekiel a vision of this valley, this valley that is dry and barren and just full of dry bones. Bones. Bones that are just laying around everywhere. It's where we get our song, the hip bone connected to the thigh bone. 
this vision of dry bones. And God asks the prophet Ezekiel, can these bones live? And Ezekiel's smart. He's listened to God enough to know how to answer God. And he says, only you know, God. He's looking at a valley of dry bones. There's no life here. It is dead. It's gone. The flesh, the sinews, the tendons, they're all gone. It's only bones. And they're not even connected. Everything has been destroyed. The walls have been broken down. The temple has been destroyed. And now they've been carried off hundreds of miles away. It's over. And God says, can these bones live? And Ezekiel says, only you know, O God. And God says to Ezekiel, to prophesy, to testify, to prophesy to those bones. And you know how God says it? God says, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy to the breath, to the bones. God says, speak in the breath of life to the bones. And you know what happens. The bones start to come together and start to form and start to be. And it's a reminder that God will restore his people, will bring them back to Jerusalem, will restore the temple, and that there's an even greater restoration that he has in mind, a restoration that you and I now live in, the restoration of Jesus Christ because he is risen. You better feel that in your heart. He is risen indeed because God has testified to the breath. And when Christ came into that room with those disciples who were locked away in fear because they worried that they were the next ones to find their way to a cross, Jesus comes in and says, peace be with you. I want you to envision a future of what God is bringing because God is bringing. God has delivered before and God will deliver again. And I am a living example of that deliverance. Peace be with you. And now I breathe on you the Spirit of God. Life, I am breathing into you life. You thought you were alive, you are now alive. If you walk in Christ, you are no longer walking as dead people. You are walking in the living blood of Jesus Christ. You are alive. And now we face the great challenge of going out those doors. And you see, John didn't leave this recording just there. He recognized that we still have a reality to face. To go out now and be sent in that same love, to speak the love of God to other people, is an enormous risk. It is a huge challenge, and it means multiple rejections. And the disciples themselves, as excited as they were to see Jesus and, and praise God and be excited, they still had to go out those doors. So they started simply. They started with someone they knew. Just like you and I, we might take our risks more with family or friends or people who might give us a hearing. They started with Thomas. And Thomas, well, he doesn't disappoint. He gave them exactly what they expected. He rejected the idea that Christ is risen. This one who followed and had been in the intimate inner circle rejected the idea that Christ was alive. He wasn't there for Christ's appearance, and there is no way that someone who is dead is now alive. And he went on to emphasize, you can just imagine the squabbling that developed. Here they are full of joy, trying to tell him, and the more and more he's agitated. And finally he says, look, until I put my finger into the marks of the nails and my hand into his side. I mean, talk about gross. But he's trying to emphasize you all are nuts. He's speaking to the physicality of reality. And the truth of the matter is you and I envision people who will reject the reality of what we have to say because the reality of what they live. And that's understandable. Why should we get upset with people who will give us exactly what we expect? So I'm telling you, we don't have to sit in fear. 
We don't have to still hide behind locked doors. We can prepare ourselves for the mission we've been given because we have been sent with the peace of God in mind and with the Spirit of God in us. And so let's do our homework. Look, I've got some books here. There's Lee Strobel, an atheist, an atheist journalist who when his wife converted to Christianity, wanted to win her back because he thought that she had joined a cult. And so he did more and more research. He used all his journalistic skills and investigated as much as he could. And then he finally came to the horrible realization, oh no, it's true. And he became a follower of Jesus Christ. Copies of this book are out in the narthex. Or here's this guy, J. Warner Wallace. Another atheist, an atheist detective, he saw the underside of humanity each and every day. He saw how good we all are at lying all the time. He followed just the facts. And when he took his skills as an investigator, a detective, and applied them to Christianity, again, he came to believe. God's crime seed, cold case for Christianity. These are easy reads, and they're fun. And they're good to have in the back of your mind when you're dealing with your friend or your neighbor or your family member who just doesn't want to have any of it. You don't have to close the sale. That's not our job. But our job is to convey, to recognize and experience and be with Thomases along the way and understand the doubt and say, yeah, I can see why you'd want to do that. That makes sense, as gross as it is. But think about this. This guy says this. What do you think of that? Or maybe Timothy Keller, kind of your modern-day C.S. Lewis, who once wrote Mere Christianity. Timothy Keller, an evangelical conservative minister who worked in New York City and particularly ministered to progressive liberal atheists. There's a nice combination. He wrote a book, The Reason for God. These are not high intellectual reads. They are down-to-earth, practical. Yeah, people have questions and real doubts. And they better run from the idea. Why should we be surprised? And if we're worried about rejection, forgive me, I'm going to say the obvious. Duh! Duh! So it was Christ. He went to the cross. And he is saying, as the Father sent me, even so I send you. That's who we are. That's who we're now called to be. But we're not without equipment. God himself has breathed life into us through the Spirit. But there's more. Thomas is there eight days later, which is the Jewish way of saying what we would think of seven days later, on the eighth day. They count the day, the present day, and go forward. So there again on the following Sunday, there they are again still behind locked doors because none of us take to this stuff very easily. This time they've got Thomas with them. Whether they bound him and tied him to a chair, I don't know. But he's there and Jesus appears again. And he says, what does he say to them? What's the first thing he says to them? Peace be with you. That's right. And then he turns to Thomas. I can see the other disciples. <laughs> Let's watch what happens here. And he says to Thomas, put your finger here. Put your hand here. You know what I hear in that? I hear a willingness of Jesus not to beat up the guy who doubted, but to recognize that you're struggling, you're hurting, you don't get it. You know what? We make a huge mistake as Christians when we hide ourselves and hide all our problems and all our struggles. When we polish ourselves up and make ourselves look all good before everyone else, they need to know that we still have wounds and hurts and pains and struggles as well. That we're no better than the person we're talking to, but what we're leaning on is the grace that we have through Jesus Christ. Otherwise, there's no difference. And because we live in that forgiveness and that grace, we are trying. 
Jesus was willing to reveal his wounds. Are you willing to reveal your wounds to those who are struggling? Because then that is part of the pathway of belief. Thomas says, my Lord and my God, we don't know whether he really put his hand, finger in the hand or his hand in the side. It doesn't tell us because that's not what matters. But Jesus says one more thing. He says, do you believe because you have seen? Blessed are all those who have not seen and yet come to believe. That's us. Blessed is everyone who's come to believe without having the proof of Jesus Christ standing right there. That's the reality because in the end, there is always a step of faith. And that's why I have every confidence saying to you, you are not the one who can close the sale. So if you're hearing that I'm trying to recruit a bunch of salespeople and make you salespeople, in the end, the image doesn't work because you cannot close the the sale. It is not in your ability. Because in the end, each and every one of us and every person out there eventually has to make a leap of faith. Has to make a conscious decision to trust that what we've learned is true. Abraham, way back, Father Abraham, the father of the faith, had to believe that God would give him a descendant, even in his old age. He had to trust. He had to believe. Ezekiel, when looking at those dry bones, who passes off the question for the moment that says, only you know, O God, but meanwhile, what am I supposed to do about these dry bones? In the end, when God says, prophesy to the breath, to these bones, I can just see him, just like you and I. Okay. Or when the instructions were given to Joshua, who's now taken over from Moses, and Moses was this great leader of the people, and they followed him. They gave him trouble from time to time, but they followed him, and they knew in the end, don't mess with Moses. But when Moses dies, and now it's passed on to Joshua, and Joshua's now in charge, it's time to test the new leader. And what does Joshua get as his first task? Oh, just go cross the Jordan, and when you step into it, the waters will roll back. Uh Uh-huh. They had to take the Ark of the Covenant, the priests with the poles on their shoulders, and they had to go cross that Jordan. And the way that was going to work was that once they had put their foot in the Jordan, the waters would roll back. Well, you know what that requires? That requires a step of faith. That requires trusting that by stepping out, God will respond. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. God has set it up such that we have to take the first step. When we work with others and try and help others to understand and so forth, we can't ultimately make it all clean and perfect. We, in the end, still have to leave it between that person and the Spirit of God to make that step. But because we don't close the deal, we can't lose track of what is true, that Jesus put a commission in our hearts. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Every year, year after year, the church throughout the generations and throughout the centuries has placed this reading the Sunday after Easter to remind us that as we celebrate the resurrection, it's now time to get to work. God has sent us. Let's go. Let's pray.